Good morning, um, good afternoon, um, and good night, depending on where in the world you are connecting to our AI webinar today. Um, welcome to our February AI webinar. My name is Ali Obedi. I'm Associate Vice President for Research here at University of Maine, and I'm also Vice President of IEEE Council and RFID. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Um, who are going to talk about very interesting topics. But before we get to the uh, main portion of our event, I would like to, um, first of all, thank our sponsors. So this event is sponsored by the University of Maine, uh, Office of the Vice President for Research, uh, IEEE Communication Society and Computer Society chapters in Maine, as well as IEEE Region 1 um, and IEEE USA. Uh, I'm also thankful to our colleagues in IEEE um, China and India for broadcasting this uh, event. And um, I would like to also um, uh, congratulate everyone and wish everyone a happy Lunar uh, New Year, um, Year of the Tiger, uh, to all our colleagues in, in China and, and Asia. And also I have a very important announcement that University of Maine has been recognized by Carnegie classification as uh, R1, one of the highest research universities uh, for the first time, and we are very excited about that. So that's why my background is a little bit different today. So with that, um, let me just switch my background to our AI event, and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, in the Q&A during both talks. We'll do both talks back to back. And then at the end, I will um, go through the Q&A and pose the questions to our speakers. So without further ado, our first speaker is Dr. Alina Zare, who teaches and conducts research in the area of AI and machine learning uh, as a professor in electrical and computer engineering department at the University of Florida. Dr. Zare's research has focused primarily on developing machine learning algorithms to autonomously understand and process non-visual imagery. Her research work has included automated plant root phenotyping using visual an X-ray imagery, 3D reconstruction analysis of X-ray micro CT imagery, subpixel hyperspectral image analysis, target detection, and underwater scene understanding using synthetic aperture sonar, lidar data analysis, ground penetrating um, radar analysis, and buried landmine explosive hazard detection. She earned her PhD in December 2008 from University of Florida prior to joining the faculty at the University of Florida in 2016. Um, Dr. Zari was faculty at the University of Missouri. So without further ado, um, Alina, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I'm really happy to be here. And so I'm gonna talk today about some of the work that we're doing in getting neural networks to be able to say, I don't know, or deal with more ambiguous inputs, okay? Before I get to that, um, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of my lab. So I run the machine learning and sensing lab. And as um, Ali mentioned, we focus on remote sensing with a lot of different sensor types um, in, a, in a lot of different sensing domains and applications from ecology and plant science, both uh, above ground and below ground plant root phenotyping and plant candy phenotyping, smart systems, um, target detection and, and some basic AI work. And one thing that has become clear through, so we're very applied, has come clear through all these applications is you always have some unexpected input when you're working with real data. And that's, that's going to be the focus throughout the day. Um, I just want to give credit to, to the people doing the real work in the lab. So these are just a slightly out of date um, photo of um, many of the students that are, that are doing the work in the lab. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about the work of two of them. And before I get to that, so, you know, we develop new machine learning methods, but nearly all machine, wor machine learning workflows have a similar sort of set of steps, right? And we have a training and a testing phase. And in training, we collect data, we label it if we're doing supervised learning, we extract features. And then as machine learning researchers, we spend a lot of time thinking about the, the model and fitting the model. And then in testing, we get new unlabeled test data and we pull out the features 
and run it through our trained model. And a lot of emphasis is on the model, but what we know repeatedly through practice and application that the collection of data, the labeling, the curation, it's a majority of the time and it has a huge impact versus effort on the outputs of your system, okay? And so being able to get data that you trust um, plays a huge role. And one of the challenges is we can never collect enough data. There's always going to be some sort of unexpected input in real practice, okay? And so that's the first thing I wanna talk about um, briefly is some of our work. And we often encounter unexpected inputs. Um, so this is a hyperspectral and LIDAR data set we collected over the University of Southern Mississippi in Gulf Park. And we were doing target detection there. And there's many things in the scene that we walked through and we labeled and we, we documented. And there's many things that are unexpected. And, and quite honestly, we don't know what they are, even as people looking at the data. Okay, And certainly is true with the machine learning systems we developed. So we need systems that they're gonna work in the world to be able to have some sort of competency awareness or recognize when an input is distinct from any data that they saw in their training set. Um, and hopefully in those cases, be able to say, I don't know. And we as people can often do that. So if you this is a little snippet of a sonar image. If you've never seen sonar before and someone shows it to you and says, what is this? You're likely to say, I don't know, I've never seen that before. But most of our machine learning systems, this is you know, <laughs> a cartoon of a, a, a smart system that's been trained on sonar. We show it a photograph of a dog. It is going to say that it is something that's seen in the sonar data more often than not. And oftentimes, with sometimes with very high confidence. Okay, so that most of our machine learning systems don't have this ability um, to say, I don't know very easily. So we've been looking at this out of distribution detection problem, which is mostly saying we have data that we've trained on and can we identify when we try to run our system on data that's semantically different? So perhaps we are inserting data from some unknown data set that's distinct from what we've trained on, okay? There's many, many out of distribution detection approaches in the literature and we can do an enormous lit review my belief is we cannot solve this with one method. We're gonna need a suite of approaches to be able to address all the different types of outliers and anomalies we may encounter. So I'm gonna talk about just one approach that we've been working on. And really we've been working on trying to leverage the null space. Okay, so what is the null space? And, and what do I mean by that? So a neural network, um, every layer is connected by a weight matrix or a set of weights that defines the connections from one layer to the next. And it's at that step, that connection, it's a linear operation. And whenever you go from a large layer to a smaller layer, there is a non-trivial null space, meaning there's a whole infinite set of samples that are mapped to zero and the network ignores. Okay, I do want to point out that this work is being led by Matt Cook, a PhD candidate in my lab. So his photo is up there in the corner. Um, and he's saying, well, we're ignoring a lot of our input. And sometimes that's good to ignore things. Okay, so for example, suppose you're developing a system that wants to detect cars and perhaps color, you don't care about the color of the car. Well you may want to purposefully put color into the null space. It's not informative for your problem, okay? But other times you are ignoring information that may be useful for being able to say, this is distinct from what we saw in training, okay? So that's our goal. And so essentially, this is just a slide saying we have these um, weights, which defines a weight matrix for a layer, and we can compute the projection of any test input sample onto the null space of the weight matrix for every layer in our network. And we can leverage that to see, are the projections in the null space for test data distinct from training data? And if so, this is an indicator that it's an outlier, okay? And, you know, there's also 
sort of unexpected results of the null space. And really, I'll just focus on the photo example here is if we have a system that's trained to identify a dog um, and we add noise from the null space. Okay, so this is noise that our network is ignoring. If we add that to the image, if we as a human look at this, we're going to say that's that's an image of noise, but the network does not see any distinction between the input image and the output, this, this sum here, because the noise is in the null space. It's, a, it's completely ignored, okay? All right. And you can also use this to sort of visualize what information is being lost or ignored and sometimes purposefully with good reason ignored from your network, okay? And so um, these are just small examples of saying, you know, you may have filters that represent certain items and you can look both at their um, uh, and inputs projection in the column space, what that feature map is. And you can also look at its projection in the null space. And that projection in the null space is what's being ignored by your network and thrown away. Okay. And this is just a plot of saying, okay, if it's, well, is this um, of any value at all? And so we've trained a network and we've seen this pattern consistently in our experiments. We trained a network, the solid line is training data, the dotted line is a validation set, and we plotted the cross entropy loss, okay? So in this small bit of training, the loss is going down, that's usually what we focus on. What we can also plot is the sum of the projection into the null space of all of our data. And what often happens is there's a quick decrease, much of the data is put into the, um, is removed that's in the null space originally is removed from the null space and used for classification. And then almost always you have this increase of now we start to identify what we're going to purposefully ignore and put into the null space. And so this is a pattern we've seen repeatedly during training. Okay, and one thing, so our goal for identifying outliers is to say, well, let's examine the portions of our input data that are being mapped to the null space, okay? and we can actually manipulate that. So we've looked at adding a term that just computes the projection into the null space to our neural net objective function. So we can minimize that null space projection during training. And then in tests, we can examine the projection. And if any test point has a large projection in the null space, we can identify it as out of distribution because it's, it's different from the training data in that way. This is just a visualization where we did that. We trained on the CIFAR 10 data set. So this is a visual imagery data set. Um, and we took the null space projections in one of the layers of the network. This was a wide ResNet network and we projected it down to 2D using the TSNE. And these are the, our known data. And then we took a different data set and just computed their null space projections in this network. And you can see they fill in, the, the second data set is this SVHN. And it fills in different parts of this, um, of this space. And so we can not only perhaps look at the overall projection amount, but see where the data is lying in the null space to identify outliers, okay? Um, quick set of experiments. We used a wide ResNet backbone architecture. We trained without our null space term and then added it in and trained with that CIFAR 10 as our inliers and all these other data sets. We said, these are out of distribution. Can we identify those? Um, and the first thing you want to say is if you add in null space um, sort of manipulation terms, does it impact your classification? And effectively, no. We have very good classification results either with or without the null space term. But then we can also compare the projection in the null space of our known data that's in blue to other data sets that weren't trained with. And what you can see is by and large, you're starting to see a distinction between the data you trained with and the data you didn't. So the null space gives an indicator of items that are out of distribution. Okay, and these are just some quantitative numbers saying CIFAR 100, um, when we compare to other out of distribution detection methods in this chart, we're comparing to a method called confidence estimation. We're on par, not, not quite as well, but in all the other um, data sets we looked at, we really, we 
we're very competitive in being able to identify out of distribution samples. So that's one thing that we're working on to say, I don't know, something has a large null space projection. I think there's a lot of interesting places we can go with that. The other thing I wanted to mention is about ambiguous inputs. So some, a lot of times what we're dealing with is all or nothing um, in our object detectors, in our scene understanders. But a lot of times what we have is we have a gradual change from one class to another. Okay, so for example, there are a lot of times there may no, be no crisp boundary between classes. So this is a snippet from a sonar image where we're going from flat sand to sand ripple. And it's very hard to say where does flat sand stop and sand ripple begin, okay? And so can we identify this gradual change in ambiguous um, inputs, okay? One way to do this is try to capture texture in our data, okay? And um, we, we capture texture uh, using histogram features as our proposed method, okay? And so this has been done historically quite a bit um, to using handcrafted features such as histogram of oriented gradients or local binary patterns and these sorts of things. And so can we have features that focus on texture embedded into our neural networks, okay? Um, and we can look at, you know, a big aspect of texture is whether we're looking at local versus global descriptors, okay? And so um, if you have a global histogram, counting the number of white versus black pixels in these images, you see no difference, but you would see a very big difference in local histograms. So texture is not only our distribution of samples sort of the statistical representation of the data, but it's also spatial, where do those items occur, okay? Um, so we started looking at how can we build histogram-based features into our neural networks to be learned more naturally than what we're seeing in, for example, convolutional neural networks right now. And convolutional networks are very good at structural textures, but they're not as good at statistical textures. And so this is a little example to try and illustrate that. What we have on these first row is like a checkerboard pattern. You can see with the black pixels here. And then we have a cross pattern and a stripe pattern. And then their first column, we're sampling date points in the foreground from different statistical distributions, a very simple multinomial, binomial, or a constant um, value, okay? And what we see is if we try to distinguish the statistical textures from each other using a convolution, that's very challenging, okay? And you often need a much more complex architectures to capture that. But with a histogram, we can represent it very effectively and efficiently, okay? Um, this is just a little um, gift to illustrate this. This is the bi multinomial, binomial, and the constant distributions we're used. And one thing you wanna know is we purposefully pick distributions that have the same average value. And if you have random, convolution kernels being applied to data sampled from this, you can't tell the difference between these. So a simple convolution is not gonna be able to tell these statistical distributions apart very easily, okay? But a histogram would, okay? So can we improve our representation of these in deep learning models? And Josh Peoples is a PhD candidate in my group has proposed a histogram layer to do that. And I just wanna know he's on the job market. So if you're looking for an awesome faculty member, he's, he's someone to talk to, okay? And so we've used histograms, standard histograms, um, manually created before, but they're very difficult to integrate into a neural network because there's a lack of, lack of differentiability and other things like this. So what Josh proposed was, approximating the histogram operation with a soft operation using radial basis functions, okay? And um, essentially you can implement a histogram operation with RBFs um, using a soft approach. All right. Oh, and one great thing is this RBF implementation can be implemented entirely using standard features in neural network toolboxes. Um, and so the, uh, you know, PyTorch, these sorts of things, you can implement it using functions that are existing. Okay, so it's very easily to implement. 
Okay, and then when we run, so Josh did a little experiment. If I run a simple convolution layer versus a histogram layer with the RBF implementation, as we would expect, the convolutions does very well at distinguishing the structural labels, but not statistical. The histogram does very well at de determining statistical, less so for, for structural, but the combination of the two, if you had networks that had both of those layers, you have a very um, superior result. Okay, and so he's applied this to a whole bunch of application areas. Most recently, he looked at um, uh, adipose tissue for trying to identify um, muscular dystrophy progression. And there's a lot of texture related in, in this to identify the different types of tissues. Um, and he did a comparison of using convolutional networks and networks that had both convolutional and histogram based layers and he very cleverly called them the Joshua net and you see a boost by incorporating these histogram layers into the networks. So that is um, oh and some segmentation results on those, but that's really everything I wanted to to, to bring up today, um, and I think this looking at things like being able to identify outliers and deal with samples that are um, not as easily represented in our current architectures and may have soft transitions between one class or the other is really an important area to look at. We're, we're excited and, and I'd be eager to hear everyone's thoughts on this. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zara, for the great presentation. And again, I remind everybody to Post your questions in the chat as we move on to the next um, speaker. So, um, as our next speaker is setting up, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Hai Zhu. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Zhu received a BS in computer science from Tsinghua University and an MS and PhD in Human Computer Interaction from Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Zhu has received an NSF um, CRII award, as well as several paper awards in venues such as CHI, CSCW, and Human Factors, as well as uh, Alan Newell Award for Research Excellence. Dr. Zhu has also taken on major service roles in the community, such as serving as the uh, Secretary and Treasurer of HCIC, and program committee member for CHI and CSCW. So without taking um, too much time, uh, Pai, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Let's see, can people see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. Today, I'm going to talk about some of our very recent work on human AI collaboration in child welfare and leverage the complementary strengths of human and algorithmic judgment. So nowadays, algorithms have been used to assist a lot of high stake decisions. For example, it has been used to help screening and um, approving the credit card applications, have been used to help with the hiring um, and help with the recidivism prediction, help judges make decisions where they should detain um, uh, defendants or, uh, uh, while they are waiting for trials. And these tools also used to help with uh, uh, predicting the policing and um, in the child maltreatment predict, uh, like uh, screening. However, um, a lot of uh, recent discussions and a lot of researchers, practitioners have, uh, have raised concern about using these machine learning or AI-based tools uh, in the high-stake decision-making context. And one of the reasons that uh, people have been citing is that these technologies often has unintended biases that can harm the already vulnerable populations in the society. For example, intelligent algorithms have been increasingly used in the criminal justice this system and um, as, uh, these algorithms, they are designed to automatically assess the risk level of the defendants. And this type of algorithm have been used in the United States to evaluate more than 1 million defendants. However, researchers have found that 
African American defendants are substantially more likely than the white American defendants to be incorrectly classified as high risk by the algorithm. Researchers also have found that uh, commercial applications for them, like Google Ads, often uh, like they displayed more high paying jobs for male users than for the female users. Uh, these are just a few examples. And in general, people are really, uh, there are like an increasing concern about the biases that these machine learning tools might introduce. And in my research, uh, I look at the, uh, a specific and also very sensitive contact, which is a child maltreatment cause screening. And, and this figure illustrates the process of maltreatment cause screening. So first of all, while the agency receive a, a maltreatment referral call, and these calls will be um, sent to the hotline call screeners, and these call screeners, they will gather information to make recommendations. Specifically, they will gather information like the family history, the current allegations, and um, uh, collect outputs from other tools. And um, in Allegheny County, and they deployed this algorithmic tool um, called AFST, the Allegheny Family Screening Tool. It is a machine learning based tool to automatically predict the children's risk. And uh, the output of AFST is also used to help the call screeners to make the screening decisions. So the, the decisions have three categories. It's either screen out, means that this case uh, is dismissed and no investigation is needed, or field screen, and they will send social workers to visit the family and to collect more information. And the third category is called uh, screening for investigation. And uh, uh, after the call screeners gather the information and provide their screening recommendation, the call screening supervisors will make the final decisions. They will look at the case report and the call screeners recommendation, as well as FST score, which as we talk about, it's a, a machine learning based uh, uh, score uh, to automatically assess the risk. And the, the, the final decision, um, uh, if the final decision is to screen in for in investigation, then the case will be, um, uh, 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 will be given to the caseworkers, and they are going to uh, work with the family agency to determine the final outcome. Sometimes the most severe outcome will be like the home removal. So they will decide, for example, the kid is at risk in the home, so they should be removed, maybe uh, put into the false care. Or So that's the whole process of the call screening. As we can see that like the, these machine learning based tools have been playing an important role in this process. As a human computer interaction researcher, um, I'm really interested in understanding how these algorithmic tools are currently used in the child welfare systems and how we can design new ways to improve the algorithm supported decision making. And uh, one of my goal is to help realize the vision of algorithmic decision support tools as a way to leverage the complementary strengths of human and algorithmic judgment. And which I'm going to talk more, more details about what we mean by leverage the complementary strengths. So the methods I use is um, the, in the two study I'm going to present today, we use mixed method. Uh, we conducted a, a quantitative analysis by studying and analyzing the historical data. And we also conducted contextual inquiry by visiting the places where the social workers work and observe how they actually use FST, how they integrate the FST decision, uh, FST recommendation in their final decision. And we we also conducted semi-structured interviews to uh, directly ask questioner questions to understand their behaviors, their reasons uh, behind their decisions. So uh, next I'm going to present two studies. The first study focuses on the disparity and um, the fairness related issues in the context of using FST in child welfare. In the first study, we want to ask these three questions. First is how racially disproportionate would completely automated FST decisions have been compared to the FST assisted decisions? So uh, we want to know that, yeah, basically how uh, 
um, uh, after introducing FST, how that affects the racial disparity. And the second question is we want to look into the accuracy. So we want to look at, yeah, uh, what would the FST uh, decisions, the accuracy of the uh, solely FST decision versus the FST assisted human decisions. And the third question we have is like, if we see any uh, differences in the FST decisions and FST assisted decisions, we want to know why. We want to know how did the workers actually use the FSC to make those decisions that leads to the different outcomes. So in this study, uh, we uh, have access to the historical data. So we got the uh, um, historical data from August, uh, August 1st, 2016 to May 13th, 2018. And this data set uh, includes uh, uh, about 47,000 cases. And we uh, look into, or we also have access to the uh, demographics information of the victims in these cases. And um, we, um, uh, we classify these cases into uh, either uh, white kids and the uh, white, uh, we specifically look into the white kids versus black kids. The way we define white kids are the people who self identify as white kids. And when they check the uh, like uh, uh, white in their uh, responses, and uh, for the black kids, we will include black, uh, we included black kids and also people who check both uh, black and any other races in their self-report responses. And our analysis is at the uh, child level. So um, we particularly look into this two decision uh, paradigm. The first uh, or scenarios. The first is a hypothetical scenario is we look into the FST only decision or we call it AI only decision. So uh, the, currently the FST actually uh, generates a score from one to 15, you know, to run the analysis and we uh, translate this uh, a score into a binary decision. So it's either screen in at high risk cases or all high risk cases, which is the scores above 15 and screen out all or the moderate risk and the low risk cases, which is the score uh, below 15. And we, uh, by the way, we actually tested out a different cutoff, a different threshold and uh, thresholding, and actually uh, the results remain, remain consistent. And for the real world uh, scenario, we just look at in real world, actually the workers, they will rely, uh, look into the FSC recommendation and they will make the final call. So uh, in this case, so we, we call it worker FSC decisions you know, or human AI decisions. Basically this, we look at the actual final decisions made by the workers. So the first of all, we want to look at the uh, screen rate disparity uh, between the FSC only decision and the worker decisions. What we found is that FSC only decision had about 20% black white disparity. So uh, more specifically, uh, if we only rely on AFST, then uh, it will, the agency would screen in about 75% of all the, uh, all the black children cases and screening uh, only 55% of white children cases. However, in the uh, worker FSC decision, what we found is that the disparity was reduced to about 7%. 7 so in reality, about like 59% of the uh, black children cases were screened in and about 52% of the white children cases were screened in. So the worker FSC decisions actually had the lower screening rate disparity than the FSC only decision. And next we look at the uh, accuracy. So here we uh, measure accuracy against the actual outcome. So for the screening case, we look at whether they, uh, the, actually, the screening case actually result in like home removal within two years. And for the screen out cases, we look at yeah, whether they uh, will be re-referred re uh, in six months or if they will eventually result in like uh, home removal in two years. So basically we'll compare the uh, uh, decision this is a screen decision with the actual outcome. And what we found is that uh, the worker FSC decisions had lower accuracy disparity than the FSC only decision. So uh, 
if hypothetically the agency use the FST recommendation, it will have about a 12% disparity in the accuracy between the black kids cases and the white, uh, white kids cases. So the, uh, the black kids uh, um, uh, accuracy for the black kids um, cases are 45, is 45% and the accuracy for the white kids cases is 57%. And the worker FSC decisions are actually lowered to 4%, basically it's 47% versus 51%. But also note that the, uh, the worker FSC decisions had a lower overall accuracy than the FST only decisions. So if we look at the overall accuracy, uh, the FSC only or AI only decision had an accuracy of 51% and the human decision have an accuracy of 49%. So here uh, we could already see there is some potential for complementary um, strengths between the human judgment and the AI judgment. So uh, overall, humans are good at reduce the disparity and they are good at like reduce the disparity in terms of screen rate, good at like reduce the disparity in the accuracy, uh, in terms of accuracy. But also overall, we could see a potential uh, like the FST actually in, uh, improve the, uh, if, uh, yeah, the FST or AI only decision have uh, a bit higher overall accuracy. So, the next question is we had is yeah how what the worker do and well, how they uh, like make decisions to actually achieve the lower disparity and we conducted interview with the cost screeners so we show some of these results to them and what we learned from them is that here are some of your uh, speculations from our uh, from the cost screeners on like why they were able to achieve lower disparity and what we heard from them is that they will make like holistic decisions. So they make these holistic contextualized assessment of the risk and safety instead of uh, uh, unlike FST, what they, uh, the FST have access is to uh, is uh, administra uh, administrative data about the family and the kids. However, uh, the cost screeners have access to the actual uh, allegation report, and they will uh, have um, they, they have contact with this uh, contact with these reporters, and they actually can make this holistic contextualized assessment, which they believe actually leads to a lower disparity. And the second main reason they were saying that they uh, they actually uh, intentionally sometimes intentionally adjust for the limitation of FST, and workers thought that the FST uh, often over or underscore the cases uh, specifically based on the system involvement like the welfare, public medical uh, medical services, uh, criminal history or CIF histories, and they realized these um, maybe uh, uh, under or over scored cases and they made some intentional uh, justifications as a result that also contribute to the lower disparity. And another interesting finding from the interviewing the participants of interviewing our social workers is that we found that the workers sometimes disagree on the accuracy measures that AVST used to train the model and also what we used to, to conduct the uh, accuracy analysis. And uh, the accuracy measure or the ground truth we use is uh, uh, both for training the FST and we using the analysis is a two year referral and home, uh, 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 home removal, so uh, um, uh, placement. Um, data, but the workers believe that many of them thought that the re referral didn't necessarily uh, indicate the actual risk. And um, for example, it could be uh, the cases could be re referred uh, for different reasons than the first re referral. So if the case got screened out, but re referred maybe within six months or in uh, two years, it does not necessarily mean that uh, the original. Uh, like decision was wrong. And also people are saying that the home removal or placement wasn't helpful either. And many removals are not uh, child abuse, uh, it's parent-child conflict. And they think that, yeah, sometimes when they make decisions, they might actually not consider, for example, parent-child conflict. 
as a safety concern. So they might make those decisions like screen out decisions and, um, in, uh, and eventually might this case at least to the home removal due to parent-child conflict. And it's counted as maybe a, a wrong decision for screening cases, but they person don't think that's a wrong decision. So uh, overall, uh, we see that there is potentially mi misalignment between the prediction uh, targets that the workers think is useful and what the FST tool is trained, uh, trained about. So the first study illustrates uh, some very interesting um, uh, phenomena and how workers actually, uh, it also leads to some interesting questions. Yeah, uh, how we could further improve the human AI collaboration and partnership in child welfare. So in the second study, we want to uh, ask these questions and we want to take a deeper look into uh, how exactly the workers' mental models of this F how the FST works and how it might actually complement their own judgment. And how do workers integrate the FST scores into their decision process? And what are the future design opportunities do the workers see for FST? So what we did is that we conducted a contextual inquiry. So we visited, uh, we visited Department of Human Services um, in the summer of 2021. And we observed how call screeners work and we every visit we spend more than three hours. And then we just sit quietly and observe how the call screeners work. We occasionally ask a question, follow-up questions while they are not working or maybe while they are in the break uh, uh, between the cases. And we also conducted semi-structured interviews after the observations. And we observed and interviewed nine call screeners and four supervisors. And we collected field notes, uh, transcripts. And uh, as a group, we conducted multiple rounds of qualitative coding analysis and group discussions so that we can uh, uh, analyze the like uh, practice and perspectives and uh, accurately. And let me see, in the interest of time, I might not go to the details of each finding. But overall, what we found is that, uh, is that actually uh, workers, they have very limited knowledge of AFST and partially due to the lack of training opportunities. Uh, however, through the practice, they gradually de uh, develop diverse, but sometimes inaccurate mental models of how AFST works. So they develop heuristics to predict and make sense of the AFST. FST scores, sometimes they even say that they have this prediction game, like trying to yeah, predict what a FST score is and see, oh, if the score actually aligns with their prediction or not. Um, but they were uh, unclear about how the features are actually uh, used to um, uh, predict the scores and how the allegation information or race information, socioeconomic identities, whether they are included as a feature or not. So uh, actually, uh, FST are still uh, largely uh, like serve as a, a sort of uh, a black box for them. And the workers are really interested in learning more about FST to avoid making faulty assumptions about the scores. And workers also use their mental models and the current allegations to inform when to rely on FST or not. So uh, what we found is like uh, if uh, workers definitely not blindly follow FST recommendation, which also uh, confirm uh, or uh, which is also consistent with what we found in the first study. So because actually workers, they override the FST decisions. That's why we see that, yeah, eventually it actually led to the lower disparity. And some people also saw value in the complementarity between the humans and the FST, but others didn't. So some thought that FST could have the potential to help increase the consistency, improve the accuracy, and even mitigate the individual human biases, but uh, others didn't understand the complementarity, and they, um, uh, what we see that some uh, social workers or supervisors, they even like um, disregard the FST, and there is a very, uh, like a low reliance on the FST, uh, FST scores. 
And what we also found is that there are organizational structural pressures that inform the usage of the tools. And some people worried about the inappropriately screening cases with low risk, but high efficacy scores, leading the caseworkers to feel overburdened. Some people saw the opportunities to restructure uh, the workers' relationship with FST through better understanding the AFST. So um, these two studies help inform the opportunities for future research. So what we found is that there are opportunities of, in terms of augmenting the uh, worker training, building more information, uh, informative interfaces, designing better model prediction, um, and also exploring other innovative ways that AI could use to help the worker and help the local communities. So I will go through these uh, uh, direction very briefly. First of all, we see the uh, see an opportunities to help workers build up their mental models of the specific ways the algorithmic guidance and their own judgment can complement each other. So what we can see that maybe we could create a better uh, training tools and environment that uh, allow workers to practice decision making and uh, uh, maybe on the real historical data, receive immediate feedback and understanding the cases where like, for example, FSE might make a better judgment than human and when like actually human could potentially make a better judgment. So um, uh, the idea is to further like uh, leverage the workers, like their own expertise, domain knowledge, but also leverage the power of AI tools. And second direction is, uh, yeah, currently the workers, they, they are just presented the, this interface basically only show the score without any explanations. But there is opportunity to build explanations that can better assist humans making decisions. And more importantly, maybe uh, in, uh, 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 maybe we could design maybe interfaces to explain how the individual uh, scores is calculated and how also explain maybe why there is a human and uh, FSC discrepancies. We also see the opportunities to design a better model, or more specifically design a better model prediction targets. We already saw that there is a misalignment between what workers perceive as a risk, uh, uh, a good indicators for a safety concern or risk, and what the model belief is the safety concern or risk. Maybe we can design like, uh, have like, uh, conduct a co-design workshops to better integrate the workers and communities and agencies' perspectives in different finding the uh, good prediction targets for creating, for training the models. Um, we, or we also see opportunities maybe to co-design performance measures to help, help better monitor the quality of the human algorithm decision-making process and outcome. And um, we also see opportunities maybe to think beyond the FST or this kind of a risk assessment tool and how the AI could be used uh, to, uh, to help address, better address community needs. Maybe it's not to only to predict the risk of the kids and the family, but we can also use these tools to predict the, for example, uh, the effectiveness or um, uh, of effectiveness of any given interventions for the cases or even help to assess uh, um, uh, social workers and the uh, uh, child welfare agency as a whole. So uh, actually a lot of community members we talk to, they, are, they seem to have some uh, like misunderstanding or have a mistrust or distrust of the use of FSE tools. So currently we're also running like community workshops to further understand their concerns and to see what we could do to help address their concerns and their needs. Um, so that's it for my uh, presentation. I want to shout out to my collaborators, my uh, wonderful students who work on these projects. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the funding agency, including NSF uh, programs on financing AI, uh, NSF uh, cyber human system, and uh, also other funding agency, including Toyota Research Institute and the Carnegie Mellon uh, Block Center. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Xu, for the great presentation. We now move into the Q&A session in the last 10 minutes that we have. And uh, the first question from Eugene is for Dr. Zare. Um, so the question is that, how to apply your algorithms for 5G communication networks for real-time applications? 
Sure. So I think that the methods that I talked about are general approaches that you can add to any sort of deep learning architecture. Um, so the, the first set of techniques was for outlier or out of distribution detection. Um, and you can do that passively by looking at the null space projections in a network you've already trained, or you can do it more actively by adding sort of null space terms that try to minimize the null space on the training data. So then differences in the test data would be even larger. Um, all of those things are something that's just, you can build into any neural network or deep learning architecture. So if you're using deep learning, so I have not done work in 5G, but if you're doing work in 5G and you have a neural network or a deep learning architecture being used, right? And, and perhaps it's trained, so it's running in real time, you can do OOD detection or outlier detection seamlessly using those techniques with an already trained network. Um, so that's one way to build it in. The histogram layer work that could be used to help better understand samples that have more statistical texture that's difficult to characterize with some of our current um, standard tools in deep learning. Um, that is a new layer, new type of uh, operation that you would add into a deep learning architecture. So again, very similarly, if there's places that you're using neural networks or deep learning in your 5G applications, you can then add this layer during the training stage and extract those sorts of features from your data as well. Um, so there's, they're fairly general. They're not tied to any particular application. Thank you very much. And a follow-up question again for Dr. Zara from Eugene is that how to apply these algorithms to remote sensing radar application and uh, in particular phase array calibration to reduce pointing error and detection accuracy versus background noise and also how many layers of neural networks do we need to get reasonably good results and what kind of numerical AI firmware can be available from your lab to facilitate researchers? So three different questions. In sure. One. So I think, you know, when it comes to radar and applying it for calibration, I think it's very similar to sort of my 5G answers. That's not a problem I've worked on specifically, but any place you're using a neural network or a deep learning architecture, you can embed these to sort of highlight outliers and get that, you know, different types of features being characterized in there. I th the question about how many layers do you need or how like the sort of architecture design is I think a very interesting one that I wanna talk about a little bit. And so I, when I talked about our null space analysis, I talked about purely from an outlier detection point of view. But one of the other things that we've been looking at is when we look at the projections of our data in the null space, what we'll often see is that projections from data from the same class um, will cluster, will group together in the null space, just like they do in the column space that we normally look at for classification of a network. And so that indicates that our architecture is, pro is maybe not right, right? So when we have clustering in the null space, that says we're throwing away information that's informative for classification. And we can change our architecture based on those null space projections. So getting at your question is like how many layers? Also, you could ask how many neurons do I need in the layer? You might be able to get that from that null space analysis. And that's something we're working on. Um, our code, just in terms of um, open source code, we, we post our code on our GitHub. And so you're welcome to, to see what we have there. Thank you very much. Um, so next question for Dr. Zhu um, from uh, Jennifer Flanagan. It's interesting to me that neither system produced great accuracy, 51% or 49% suggests that we could almost um, as well making random guesses. Is that correct? So um, first of all, yes, that's what the analysis seems to suggest. But on the other hand, while we are talking to the uh, cost screeners, they were mentioning that the accuracy measure we use 
might not be the uh, right ones to use so for various concerns that I just talked about, like uh, they believe that the referral uh, back to the system in six months, if it's screened out, and it does not mean that the original screen out decision is wrong because maybe they were re referred for a different reason, etc. So, and so it's, uh, uh, there is some concern about whether the accuracy measure is the right measure and but on the other hand i do think that yeah the accuracy is definitely not high which also shows that it's an extremely challenging problem and but i definitely don't think that we should use a random guess for such a high stake <laughs> context so um it's, it turns out like um, if we believe the accuracy measure still have some meaning then like both human uh, and human AI decisions are not making uh, are, are not great, um, but it's also possible that the accuracy measure uh, are not the most uh, yeah appropriate ones. Thank you very much. And uh, again, next question for Dr. Zhu: uh, Will you plan to extend your research for larger metropolitan like uh, LA and New York, where Hispanic and Asian community are also important and it would be interesting to also study the disparity in the police force in big cities too mm -hmm. to improve racial mm -hmm. harmony. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, we would love if possible to extend our research and to look into uh, other areas, uh, other uh, major uh, metropolitan areas in the United States. Um, however, I think our research, uh, research is possible because of the support of Department of Human Service in Allegheny County. They provide us access to the data. Um, they allowed us to like audit the tools they use and they also um, uh, provide, uh, give us us access to their physical locations. So all of these are not uh, like that. It's not easy. <laughs> so uh, without the kind of support, it's uh, unlikely maybe to replicate, for example, uh, in another uh, places. So, but we uh, we do trying to uh, we do think that like child welfare, child protection, and also use of AI tools in this uh, in this context uh, is a national problem or a national um, or a, a problem with a national interest, not just what uh, it should be interesting to the Allegheny County or the Pittsburgh area and uh, also uh, in other public decision making contexts like policing we also see the value of the uh, uh, like potentially the, our approach so we do encourage maybe other research researchers if you, they have access to the data maybe to the uh, uh, to the places or the locations and then they might be able to use this mixed method approaches to audit the use of the uh, tools uh, in their uh, local communities and identify ways to like further improve uh, or the further design like better tools. Very good, thank you so much. And next question is for Dr. Zaria again. Um, I need, a, I have a need to detect anomalies, buried objects in a sensor, in a sonar time amplitude between, but without building a sonar image. Would your Joshua histogram approach be better to identify anomalous returns? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think uh, so. That is something we have applied it to sonar data um, for identifying outliers, and and very um, straightforwardly, in which we've trained networks to detect and classify the objects we're interested in, and then examine that null space to identify outliers. So I'd be happy to talk about that that more with you. Please reach out. Very good. Thank you so much. And we are out of time. This is all the time we have today. I want to thank our speakers again, Dr. Zara and Dr. Zhu. Very interesting topic, very informative presentation. Thanks all the attendees for attending today. We'll post the videos later on. And I want to close by thanking our sponsors again, IEEE Communication and Computer Society uh, chapters in Maine, IEEE Region 1, IEEE USA and our colleagues in uh, IEEE Bangalore in India and IEEE Shenzhen in China and also in Silicon Valley area, our colleagues who are promoting this event for us. So thanks very much again, everyone, for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.